Hello, hello everyone. Hello to our panel uh, residents. Hello to Marina Tabasum joining us today from Bangladesh. Um, it's a pleasure. It's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to T-Space Architecture Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the sixth in a series of eight public lectures organized by T-Space within the framework of the Architecture Residency Program. I am Irini Zahrelia. I'm joining you from New York City. I'm a practicing architect and an educator and I've been involved with T-Space as an instructor for the residency program uh, since 2017 and in the last three years I've been directing the educational programming in addition to instructing our residents. Our co-host for this uh, residency is Hannah Hill. Hi Hannah, um, it has been a great pleasure to have you and great for, for your great support. I'm very grateful. Uh, Hannah and I, we will take just a few minutes uh, for the introductions uh, while everybody in the audience is settling in. And I will give you a very brief introduction of T-Space and its programming for those who are joining us for the first time, perhaps. T-Space is a non-profit organization. It's an initiative of the Stephen Maron Hall Foundation uh, located in Rhinebeck, New York. It focuses on the arts, education, design, and ecology. And in addition to the architecture residency program, T-Spaces organizes the synthesis of the arts events um, and those uh, support the coming together of the arts, uh, including art, architecture exhibition, poetry readings, music performances, and those all take place on the grounds in Rhinebeck. We are very thrilled to have our current T-Space artist, Anne Hamilton. Her show um, titled As After Is Before uh, just opened uh, in uh, Rhinebeck at T-Space and uh, Anne gave a lecture uh, this past week for the residency. You can find all these resources and videos on our website as well as the YouTube channel and Hannah will be um, posting some links in our chat uh, that you may find useful. Uh, Anne's show will run until August 20th. I very highly recommend you go visit uh, T-Space is open to the public uh, during open gallery uh, days and also by appointment. Again, this is information you can find on our website and here in the chat. Today, um, the lecture by Marina Tabasum um, focused on her practice and light, um, uh, reflecting on the theme of uh, the residency, which is called light and polychromy. The lecture is part of the architecture residency program. As I mentioned, the residency is a 25-day design intensive. It takes place once a year, every July. It's now in its seventh year. Uh, and young professionals from around the world are joining us uh, virtually uh, this year um, to uh, experiment with design and uh, to uh, discuss uh, critical uh, uh, thinking and ideas. Our residents uh, this year, Michael, Rasika, Isabel, YP, Yasmin, welcome on the panel. It's great to have you on the program. And I would uh, briefly end on a note about uh, scholarships. Uh, we are very pleased that all our residents this year are supported by scholarships and are able to join the program free of charge. Uh, and this year, uh, we're also offering a travel stipend. So our residents will be joining us in person in Rhinebeck upon the completion of the program. And this is all possible thanks to the very generous support provided by certain institutions and individuals, including Ellis Jaff and Jeffrey Brown, Steve Pullimon, the JM Kaplan Fund, Leica Geosystems, the Al Help Foundation, the Pratt Family Fund, Archive Fine Art Inc., and its affiliates, Art Creating Inc. and ACLA, Richard Armstrong, Arlene Shahad, John and Mar Martin Cummins, Stan Allen, Margo and Anthony Viscusi, Donna Moylan, and Dr. Ben Chu. We're very grateful for your support, and support uh, is very welcome uh, from our audience as well, who can simply text for architecture to 707070 to make your contribution. Um, I will pass it on to Hannah very briefly to describe the structure of the webinar, and then we'll introduce our speaker for today, Marina Tabasum. Thank you. Thank you, Irini. And 
for everyone in attendance, I've dropped in some relevant links and ways to donate in the chat if you're interested. And I will also be posting things as we go on throughout the lecture or at the end of the lecture. And please feel free if you have any questions to drop them in the chat or the Q&A function on Zoom. And we'll be happy to address those at any time and especially at the end. So the structure today will be uh, a presentation by Marina for about 35 to 40 minutes, and it will be followed by approximately 15 minutes of Q&A from the residents on the panel as well as the attendees. And feel free to use these at any time, and I will be monitoring that while Marina gives her presentation. And again, we're so happy that you're all here joining us today, and I will pass it on to Rasika Badave, one of our residents, to introduce Marina Tabasum. Yeah, hello everyone. Myself, Rasika, I'm practicing architect from India. It's, it's an honor and my great pleasure to welcome Marina Tabasum to the T-Space Friendback and Stephen Marian Hall Foundation Architecture Lecture Series 2023. Marina is Bangladeshi architect and educator, founder, founded her own studio called Marina Tabasum Architects in 2005 at Dhaka. In her work, Marina seeks to establish a language of architecture that is contemporary, yet reflectively rooted to place, always against an ecological rubric containing climate, context, culture, and history. Her project, the Baitu Roof Mosque in Bangladesh, is distinguished by its lack of popular mosque iconography, its emphasis on the space and light, and its capacity to function not only as a place of worship, but also to refuse for the dense neighborhood on Dhaka's periphery. Her work is well regarded in world world as an environmentally conscious, socially responsible, historically and culturally appropriate. Every project undertaken is a sensitive and relevant response to the uniqueness of individual site context culture and people. Marina is a professor of TU Delft in Netherlands. She held the Gary Chair at University of Toronto 2022-23. She has taught in Harvard University uh, Graduate School of Design, University of Texas, Bengal in Institute, and Brack University. Thank you so much, Marina, for joining us today. Please join me in welcoming Marina Tabasum, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you, Rashika. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, everybody. And hi, I am joining in from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Um, I'm 10 hours ahead of, uh, of uh, New York, actually. I, I understand that not everybody is, is actually in New York. Everybody's joining in from different locations. So wherever you are, uh, my best wishes. So um, today, I know that uh, the, the brief was sent to me by Hannah. So I know that you're working with light. And, uh, and so in many ways, I myself um, have always been very interested uh, in the aspect of light. And I, I see light as an element of architecture. And, and so in a way, I'm, I'm trying to kind of uh, talk about light in many ways, but also at the same time, how I have tried to develop my language based on where I'm practicing, which is in Bangladesh. So, you know, you all know this building, which is um, our parliament building by Louis I Khan. And, um, you know, one of my first experiences of light happened in this building. And that was actually um, when, uh, and when we were in architecture first year, and we uh, are generally taken to this building as a visit um, uh, to have an understanding about what architecture is all about. And so I think that was in, uh, in the late uh, 80s, sometime in 89 or so, that our professors took us there. And, you know, when I was there in the ambulatory, which is actually the, the seven floor high um, space, which connects the main parliament chamber with the eight buildings that are surrounding it, which are the offices and other functions. And this ambulatory has this beautiful light that comes through the glass block ceiling uh, or the roof and and it creates an ambience which is so magical that I think for the very first time in my life I experienced the magic of light the power and the presence of light that can actually change an atmosphere 
And I think that was the time when I realized that light is actually uh, an absolute, um, an important and vital element in architecture. And so throughout my work, that's what I've been trying to practice and, and I've been working with. Um, so uh, other than light also, I mean, our physical and emotional perception of space are influenced by not only just light, but also wind, temperature, aroma, sound, texture, color. I mean, we all know that if you have, obviously you've read, read Yuhani Palazma's books and you know, all the sensory uh, perceptions that we, uh, that we feel are all about it. And in many ways, uh, the, as architects, we try, we design these, these kind of sensory feelings. And you know the choices that we make uh, uh, in our design, in terms of our sections, the way we bring in light, the way we bring in airflow, or even um, the material choices that we make, actually uh, decides or defines the way a person will feel that space. And uh, it could be very cheerful, celebratory. It could be melancholic. It could be. Um, distressing or even calm or contemplative, spiritual. And all of these aspects are entirely up to us when we design the space. So I think that's a very powerful uh, yeah, role that we play when we building or when we design a space. Um, and so I, I'll just go into uh, the aspect of where I am, well, how I have developed my language. So if you see that red dot, basically that's where Bangladesh is located. and and it's, uh, you know, the Tropic of Cancer cuts through Bangladesh, which makes it a subtropical climate. We have, uh, we, are, we are blessed with generous light. Um, and so I think light can become a very important element in our architecture. But at the same time, we have this uh, subtropical climate where we have rain, uh, which is the monsoon season. And then we have this dry season where we do not have rain. And so I think you know the climate and the location, the geographical location and the geoformation in many ways um, makes us who we are. And, uh, and it's actually uh, something that also impacts our culture, our history, everything is related to this geography and climate. And so as I was mentioning that we have a hot summer month, which is uh, uh, the only blessing at that time, is the rainfall that we get. And then we have these clouds um, during this monsoon season. And I think that's also quite interesting when I was in the parliament building, which I felt that when the cloud was covering the sun, all of a sudden the entire space became much more somber. So I think this movement even with cloud and the, and the, and the connection between the building and the sun also creates these ambiences and, and has this very finer quality, which I think is, very magical in many ways. Um, and then we, as I said, that we have a very dry season, which is quite dusty and, and but cooler, but dusty. And so I think, um, you know, these are uh, very important elements for me when I design. So, um, so I, I think I try to, what I try to do is try to try to base everything into the context. I try to take the essence out of the context and it's about the place, which is, you know, place is about seeking architecture is actually that begins by the understanding of the location, geography, uh, land formation, climate, as I talked about, you know, the, the, the basic uh, uniqueness that gives us our identity. And time is something which is relative, which is now, and it constantly changes. And, you know, it, it changes our sociopolitical system. It changes everything. And that change is, again, uh, uh, creates another kind of a matrix. So place and time together creates that context. And, and that's what I try to look into. So just to give a very quick background about Bangladesh, it's a, it's a delta, basically, two thirds of Bangladesh is delta. So it is mostly a water or riverine country. So we have a lot of different kind of riverscape uh, more than 700 rivers, quite large, mighty rivers. And this is the Ganges Delta. And so a uh, lot of the parts of Bangladesh are still active Delta, where you can see that the rivers are constantly shaping and reshaping the lands. 
um, some of the deltas have become mature and they do not move anymore, but there are certain places where it's still very active. And so we have a lot of land erosions. And here you can see the fragile soft soil, which is actually accumulation of silt that's brought in by the rivers from the Himalayas and all the different areas that it has crossed from China to India and then going through Bangladesh into the Bay of Bengal. And so um, basically this soft fragile soil is what makes Bangladesh. We do not have any uh, stone as such, all we have is earth. And this earth is actually uh, created this delta deltaic formation. And so if you look into Bangladesh's architecture, especially in this region, you'll see that you know, all the architecture, even from these pre uh, Mughal era, this is from the uh, 16th century BCE, or we, we even have more uh, older monasteries like from the second century, third century BCE. And you'll see that they are all built with brick. And brick is actually the only material which is permanent, which means that you take earth, you bake it into brick, and that's what you get. So this is one of the uh, sites which is uh, which you can see is a temple which was broken down. Um, uh, it's an archaeological site. And so brick has become a material for us. So if I want to seek material locally, that's the only material I have, which is about permanence. And uh, here you can see this is a brick kiln in construction and, and the light inside is, is just uh, beautiful. We have great mesons uh, to work with. So here you can see uh, the brick masonry um, and, and a lot of handcrafting that also takes place. So most of the buildings are uh, handcrafted. And as I was mentioning that the climate uh, uh, till date, I mean, now with the global warming, things are changing, but um, till now uh, we've had a very, uh, you know, very moderate kind of a temperature where you do not need any kind of insulation or anything. Uh, buildings can breathe on their own. The indoor and outdoor doesn't need to be sealed off. So there could be a certain kind of a connectivity between the two. And so uh, a primordial architecture in, a, in our delta, it, all you require is basically a roof to cover yourself. And, and, and basically that's it. And to keep us above the water level because we have a lot of flooding and, and rain that happens. So basically keeping us above the rain. This building, as you see here, is the first uh, modern architecture building in Bangladesh that was built in 1952 by Mazhar al-Islam. And um, this kind of set up the tropical modernity that uh, exists in Bangladesh. So many of our projects actually focus on this idea of blurring the boundary uh, where we do not have uh, any solid facades on the edges, but tries to create a connection between the indoor and the outdoors. Uh, so in a way to bring in light and ventilation. And, and so porosity is an important element in architecture for us because you need to breathe your building. You need to constantly breathe them to create this uh, circulation uh, uh, and uh, cross ventilation because um, of the high humidity during the summer months. So cross ventilation during the summer months is, a, is an absolute importance. So you know, cotton is our fabric. So even our facades uh, takes this kind of an approach where um, the skin of the building becomes porous, which is which allows the air to come in and, and to let it out. And so much of our building skins are also around that uh, notion where you can see that um, we try to avoid bringing in the hot summer sun, but at the same time, by using fins here, as you can see in this building, which is a residential building um, of a 12 story. And uh, here we try to create these apertures where it allows the air to come into the building and create this cross ventilation, makes it breathing, but at the same time, uh, not taking in uh, the entire hot summer sun uh, from the west facade and the east side also. So that's, uh, that's you can see here, that the west sun hitting the building, but at least the building, the inner spaces do not get the hot sun, uh, the heat in that sense. Uh, so, you know, many of these buildings, we try to create this uh, shade and shadow 
that is of course coming out of sun and the light that is generated so we want to bring in the light but at the same time we want to create this shade and shadow so that the glass remains uh, in the shade but at the same time the facade can also create this interesting pattern of shade and shadow that really adds to the whole uh, idea of the building skin. Uh, so this is uh, one, another building which has tried out, which we tried out with a similar kind of an idea. Um, it's an office building basically. So um, I think a lot of the inspiration that I, my architecture or through in my architecture I take is from my experiences of childhood. Like this courtyard on the right side is from my from my old home where I lived or grew up. And um, and so, you know, the courtyards have been, you know, I, I would say in our old times before the air conditioning era or when air conditioning became much more popular in houses, this was actually the, can, the space that conditioned the air and the light. And so it, it, air in the courtyard would become much more cooler and then the long veranda that used that was uh, used as a buffer to bring in the air which would be then a cooler air and then the hot air would go out and so in many of my uh, earlier projects this is what I've done like the one you see on the left hand side where um, we tried to use the idea of stack effect where you bring in air uh, from the sides as the hot air goes up and so the stack effect actually creates the cross ventilation and really helps uh, the breathing of the building. But at the same time, this high volume also adds to the character of the light that comes into the space, which is kind of diffused and, and creates a certain kind of an ambience um, into the main space. Um, as you can see here, this is a courtyard open to sky uh, in a small apartment building that we designed. Um, in in the early to uh, in the early uh, times, uh, two hundred. I mean, about twenty years ago. So um, many of my buildings have this idea of creating this inner core or the courtyard or the central atrium space. Uh, like in this building, as you see here, the center, which is a kind of a nine square plan, and the center again creates that stack effect, which really allows the air to flow into the building. And, um, and so and the building has these four corner courtyards, which also helps um, in cooling the building down and also allowing a certain kind of an ambience of the uh, architecture. Um, and as I was mentioning about these long verandas, which is actually the double skin um, of our architecture in the older times, which really use, was used as a buffer between uh, the main rooms and the outer facade. And so these long verandas were actually spaces where life was lived. Rooms were actually for sleeping, whereas these long verandas were where people generally used to, uh, you know, spend their entire day uh, sitting around watching outside, but in a in a shade, but also at the same time connected to nature. And so I think um, that's something I also try to seek even now in many of our projects, like this one we designed, where we tried to recreate this long veranda. Now, which is kind of a wrapping around the building. And, uh, and we have these long shaft courtyards also, which allows this uh, ventilation to go through the building so that it has the courts um, and also the veranda uh, to, to recreate that uh, sense of feeling of, um, uh, of comfort. So here's the plan where you can see the, uh, the different floors and how the courtyards basically changes in different times and the, and the outer facade also at the same time. So the idea is actually how we can actually learn from what was the old wisdom and, and try to make our buildings operate on their own instead of being completely dependent on artificial means. And so it's not only uh, creating a certain kind of a language of architecture, but at the same time, it also allows uh, the natural way of, uh, of a building to operate. So Dhaka is the city where I am based uh, and it is one of the largest mega cities and one of the fastest growing mega cities, which has 20 million population altogether at the moment. And so um, it's a fast growing city and like many Asian cities, we also have this uh, dual 
uh, way of survival in, in the city where you can see different income groups um, in, uh, in living in coexistence in many ways. Um, some are registered and documented, some are undocumented, whom we call informal, but one is not or cannot live without the other. So it's a kind of a symbiotic relationship. The city, as you can see, is, a, is one of the densest in the world. Um, we have, I think now it's almost 50,000 per square kilometer area. Uh, and so one of our very early projects, uh, you know, which uh, was a museum, uh, which is a museum that we designed. And I would like to show the museum because it has a lot of component of light and, and this whole idea of ambience. So this is the city of Dhaka, as you can see. And um, if you look at it, look at it carefully, there's basically very few green areas that are left um, anymore uh, to be used. So there's the parliament complex right here up there, and there are some little green pockets. And these green pockets were actually from the British colonial time. And after that, we never had any kind of larger park areas that were developed. So the city is quite packed with dense uh, uh, construction. And so uh, one of these projects, which is the Museum of Independence, which we won uh, and we were, uh, we were commissioned to design. And so basically, which is here and located in a park setting. And this is one of the last remaining parks in the city. And so when uh, this project came about and it was about building a museum and a, and, and, um, and a celebratory space with the Museum of Independence, uh, the first dilemma was whether we would build a building in a, in a park-like setting. So that led us to kind of designing something which I'll talk about. So this very ground, the site, uh, is actually a very historically significant place where during the British colonial time, it was used as a horse racing ground. Before that, during the Mughal time, it was um, a, a, a garden. And then uh, after the British, uh, British left uh, Indian subcontinent and Bangladesh became East Pakistan, at that time, this was also a very active uh, politically charged space where a lot of political actions, activities and uh, speeches happened, a lot of gatherings happened at that time. And then uh, uh, Bangladesh had a nine month long war between the East Pakistan and West Pakistan, which is a kind of a history um, um, where Bangladesh used to be uh, East Pakistan. And so the war was to free ourselves from being Pakistan to becoming a sovereign country, which is Bangladesh. And so uh, it, it, it happened through a really long, intense, bloody war. Uh, and in, um, the, the war started in March 1971 and it ended in December. And so this is the very ground also where the, the entire war was triggered by our um, by a very powerful speech by our father of the nation, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and also uh, the same ground where uh, the surrender uh, took place uh, after the war. So it's a very important historical ground. And uh, so uh, in 1997, after 1971, when we became a sovereign country, after all these years, the, 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 the government wanted to build a museum to commemorate our independence and to commemorate the fact that we have lost so much um, to the war. And at the same time, we became a sovereign nation. So there is this duality of joy and sadness, both engraved into Bangladesh's birth. And so that's why um, that museum and the Tower of Independence was an important uh, event for our history. So basically um, this is the site and that's the project that we designed where uh, we basically took the museum below grade uh, to retain the, the quality and the atmosphere of the park space so that it's just a plaza, the roof of the museum where we have a, a water pool and, a, and the Tower of Light and a wall that basically takes people down uh, to, the, to the museum below grade and a, and a reflecting pool, which is around. So this is the section, as you can see here, uh, we have the tower and the museum below grade. The, the water basically draws into the central chamber that you can see here. 
and um, and so this is a uh, this is commemorating or suggestive of the nine month long war that we had. Um, and so, uh, as I'll just go quickly to show you the images. So that's the plaza where people generally come. It's a it's a vibrant open space. There's light. There is uh, this uh, the sense of celebration where everybody comes together during different events. And um, so that's the pool, which has this central uh, hole in the middle uh, and the wall, as you can see on the side, and then the Tower of Light. Um, that's the museum below grade. And so as you enter the museum through ramp, um, there's the audiovisual room and then the, the different spaces of the museum with the central uh, chamber in the middle. Um, I'll just show you very quickly how this whole thing works. Basically, as you go down, so you are basically descending into the into the uh, sort of a womb of the earth, where the sadness and the and the genocide and the killing and all the all the difficult struggles are sort of embedded into the uh, into the heart of the country in many ways. So the idea was that how can you bring in light, if, even though it's below grade, almost twenty four feet below grade. So. Um, so we tried to bring in light as much as possible uh, by the corners, through the roof, uh, so that it creates a certain kind of an ambience into that space. And, and the whole space is, um, there's just uh, these um, different panels, as you can see here, printed on glass. And, and the whole history of the war and the, and the liberation of Bangladesh is just imprinted in these spaces. As you go through that space, and then you come to this very dark space, which is a, uh, which we call, uh, you know, uh, which is actually holding all the images of the genocide and killing um, that has happened during that time, and kind of showcasing the atrocities and the brutality of the war. And then from that space, you enter into this space, which only has light coming through the oculus. And this was very intentional that we don't want any kind of exhibit in this space. This is a very contemplative space where you have the water coming down. So it's the water column, you know, which has a sound. So the sound really affects one uh, and, the, and, and basically the light coming through the water. So I think that together, the water, the column and the sound and nothing around it uh, and the light that's filtering through that, um, through the water creates a certain kind of an ambience and that's what i'm trying to talk about that when we design we design feelings so when you are there when you stand there you immediately feel the that very sense of sadness of that of that um you know loss that one has uh, felt uh, through this war and so um in a way once you get out of that space um uh, you know, then slowly you can go up, but that's that's actually the space we did. And and the idea of, of the concrete is also very, it's, it's not a beautiful concrete. It's a very uh, sort of a textured, uh, we didn't do any kind of finish to that because it we wanted the building to have that sense of brutality um, that is about war. And, um, and so you go up slowly to the different spaces, and then you come out, and once you come out to the plaza, you are you see that tower, tower of light, and um, this was an idea for us that we didn't want the uh, uh, the independence monument to be um, to be a tower of glass. It's it, the material is glass because glass holds light quite beautifully, and it's stacked in a way uh, the way we've created the panels. It's stacked in a way that it refracts the element of light and and it creates this uh, very prismatic uh, effect when there is direct light coming through the uh, material of the glass uh, so it it has this very interesting way of um, holding light so so this uh, our idea was that uh, that we would like to uh, symbolize freedom with the idea and the notion of light and so uh, in the evening, when there is no light uh, around the building, uh, we try we lit it from the outside. So you get this beautiful ambience, which is a sort of a beacon of hope uh, for a young country, which was, uh, you know, got its freedom and independence in 1971. 
And this is one of our uh, celebrations uh, on the 16th of December, which is the Victory Day. And you can see the amount of people, you know, having uh, concerts and things like that. The other project that I would like to show you is the, is the mosque project, which also again has to do with light, but in a very different way. So the mosque, which is located in the northern part of Bangladesh in Dhaka, the city of Dhaka, where you see the blue dot up there. And uh, it's, it's absolutely at the edge, uh, the northern edge of the city. And the city is a growing city. So this area, which used to be farmlands, now has become a complete settlement uh, where people are living. So it's a place which has gone through a transformation from becoming from an agrarian land to a much more of a settlement uh, of residences. So my grandmother, who owned a part of the land in that area, she donated the land to give uh, to to build a mosque because there was no mosque around that area. So and she gave me the responsibility uh, to design it. And so um, this is you can see the groundbreaking ceremony where. Uh, the land was donated and and you can see my grandmother sitting there right next to the haystack and basically this is an event where it was declared that the, we will be building the mosque and to just give you a little idea about how this whole thing works is that we have the Kaaba at the center at this in this drawing here where you can see that uh, the the entire Muslim uh, Ummah the all the Muslims around the world basically uh, centers Kaaba and, and do their prayers. So all the prayer halls uh, of the world, uh, Muslim prayer halls, are, um, are focusing the direction of Kaaba. And that direction is called Qibla. So basically, that's an important element. And if you look into the history of Islam, you'll see that the mosque form uh, was generated from a house form. And it, was, it did not have the grandeur and the rigor that we now see. It was basically an elongation of the house form and turned into a, uh, a space for prayer. So that was an important uh, event and, an, and, and a starting point for me because I wanted to go back to the very essence of where the mosque, uh, the whole typology of mosque came from. And then if you look into the mosque architecture all around the world, you'll see so many different varieties and so many different ways of dealing with it. So basically the idea is as Islam moved from the Arabian Peninsula towards East and West, it took on different kind of its architectural style and you know the local crafting, local material, um, the local climate. So basically adapting to the location. And I think that's one of the most unique uh, idea about building mosques. Um, and, and as you can see here, there's so many different varieties. And in our own land in Bangladesh or in the Bengal, um, this is the kind of mosque that, that were first built um, in the 13th and 14th century when Islam came to Bengal. And so I, and, and now the mosques that we see has no relationship or no connection to this old architecture. And I felt that, you know, this is a such beautiful, authentic forms that we have completely lost. So the idea was, how can I recreate this connection? So that was an important element for me. And then as I was talking about light, so light um, to me became a very important element in this project because I didn't want to uh, recreate the symbolic aspect or the symbolism of a mosque uh, to, to identify the idea and the values of Islam, but I wanted to focus more on the quality of space, the, the spiritual quality of a, of a prayer hall where one would come and, and have that sense of divinity of trying to reconnect with the divine. So that basically was for me uh, the major uh, uh, challenge in this project. And so I looked into all the different spaces which has that quality of spirituality. And here you can see Hagia Sophia or even the mosque in Cordoba, where the light has been so beautifully used. And, and, and one thing you'll see that the source of light is not as visible. It's about the, uh, the ambience and the, and the diffused translucent uh, form of light. And so that's the site, as you can see here. And the site has, uh, this is a 75 feet by 75 feet um, um, a square site. And the prayer hall we put in the middle and the prayer hall needed to be shifted 
to be um, in the same direction with uh, Mecca. So, uh, so what has happened in this case is that, you know, you can see the transition where uh, initially I tried to move the, uh, or rotate the uh, prayer hall uh, on the left side drawing. And then I introduced the circle, which actually helped that rotation where you do not get these corners. And what I uh, gained through this uh, in, uh, insertion of the circle is that I got these four courtyards, which are these high volume, which could then create the stack effect for, uh, for ventilation. And at the same time, uh, looking into the older architecture and trying to recreate a language of architecture, which could then um, be much more in connection with the old uh, Sultanate mosques that I showed you earlier. So basically the prayer hall in the middle and all the ancillary facilities are on the side. So this became the conceptual design and the drawing. And here you can see um, how this whole thing works. So as I was mentioning that my grandmother gave the project to me and so and she passed away in 2006. Uh, that was right after a year of the commissioning. And so um, it became my responsibility to generate fun to uh, uh, to then also do the construction. So I became the designer, the client, the fundraiser, the, the contractor, everything in one. And so, uh, so to, to sort of generate fund was, a, was a, one of the major challenges. So the fund came from the community, from the local people, from different sources of family, friends, and everybody. So I had to be very careful about how I use that fund. So that's why you'll see that the wrapping around the building has no concrete in it because concrete construction is much more expensive. Whereas uh, the prayer hall is the only part where I have concrete construction where I didn't want any column in the middle. So it needed to be one single span uh, so that people can uh, use that space for prayer. So here you see the, the drawing. So the ground floor plan, you see that uh, people generally come from the Southern side uh, the Mecca uh, for us is in the west, basically. So, so we pray towards west direction. And then, uh, so you enter and then you have the ablution on one side and then basically going into the spaces. Um, so you'll see, if you look at the section, you'll see that, uh, that the building is more or less a solid building where uh, there is not so much of opening except for where people enter. And it's a very perforated building, but at the same time, it takes in light um, from the top. Um, so here uh, you can see that the, the porous brickwork, again, uh, to ensure that we have a breathing facade. And if you look at this site here, the surrounding context, it's already filling up with settlement and people living there. So the mosque, uh, which is, you can see here, uh, has the entrance from the Southern side, but at the end, nobody will be able to see the mosque anymore when all the buildings come up. So the idea was not to look outside, but to look within. And that's what we generally do when we go to a religious space that we want to look within in ourselves to contemplate in many ways. So, um, so yeah, this is that area. It's a low income neighborhood in a way, lower, lower middle income neighborhood. And um, the, there is not much of planning in place. So it's, it's just growing on its own. Um, and so that's uh, basically how the whole thing is working. Uh, we have a high plinth, which really works as a place where people can generally gather and, and, and sit around. The brick is very local, locally sourced brick. Uh, masons, local masons. So the project is very low budget project in that sense. And here you can see the prayer hall uh, where you can see the the, the quality of light changes from the outside to the inside. And this is what I was talking about when I said that there is this open to sky courtyards, um, which actually helps the, to generate airflow, but at the same time, it also uh, helps the acoustic of the building. And as I was mentioning that light is, um, is an important element. And if we want to create that sense of spirituality, light really helps because when you don't reveal the source, but there is light coming through by washing onto the surface of the walls, it immediately creates that beautiful ambience of, uh, of connectivity to the spirituality. And um, yeah, so these porous 
brick uh, porous light that you can see down here is the only ornament of the building. Um, and there is no other adornment. It's a very elemental kind of a space. And, and, and it constantly changes uh, the light, uh, changes the ambience as, as the sun moves through the day and also throughout the year. So I think that's quite an interesting uh, way of uh, dealing with light. When, when there is a connection with the nature, um, the space uh, generates its own life. And I think that life is an absolute important element for architecture. Um, I think I will finish quickly with another small mosque project, which is uh, in a village um, right next to an old house, which is 200 year old. And this house was re recently renovated by an architect because it was completely dilapidated. So he, uh, uh, so he's a restoration architect. So he basically restored the building, and he won. And 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 the family who who this house belongs to wanted me to design the mosque, which is already which was already an existing small mosque, but it was not in a very good shape. So if you see the site here, so that's the building, the main house, and it is bounded by a boundary wall, and then right outside the boundary is the is the mosque located, and then we have a a water body or a pond. Um, here you can see probably a little bit better with the drone image. So the mosque is right here. So again, as I was, it's a very small mosque. So basically a load bearing brick structure and nothing else. There's no column in between. Um, the idea again was to bring in airflow and the idea was about light and the ambience. And uh, it was about just creating a space which is of spirituality in many ways. So that's the pond. And from there, you can see the mosque. Um, generally, people use the pond to do their ablution or washing before they go into prayer. This is from inside the house looking into the mosque. And basically using local brick again. And it's, a, it's just an opening. And again, trying to recreate that connection with the older mosques that we have. Um, so uh, this is during the construction, and you can see this is an entirely load-bearing structure. There's not a single column or any concrete inside this building except brick. And, and here it's an after its completion, you can see the play of light that's coming through the space. And here um, uh, during the prayer, one of the Friday prayers here. Uh, so the ceiling is being rested on the brickwork, and there's light coming through. And it creates a very nice ambience into the space. Uh, the floor has a sort of a reflective uh, floor so that it kind of uh, creates that sense of uh, larger space rather than being a very small one. Um, I have a small project. I mean, we've, we've been doing for the last three years, we've been working in the Rohingya refugee camp and uh, we've done such, uh, we've been doing quite a lot of humanitarian projects. We've also created a foundation and I think I'll just very quickly show you uh, some images of the works that we've been doing in the Rohingya refugee camp. So Rohingyas are people from Myanmar, as you know. So they've been uh, through ethnic cleansing and genocide. They've been taken out, uh, thrown out, and a lot of them had crossed the border and came to Cox's Bazar. That's in Bangladesh. And we have we host about one million refugee in in, in Cox's Bazar in a place called Ukia and Teknaf. And here you can see the map. Of the uh, of the houses of every individual refugee families, and you can see the density um, of this whole area. So one million people in a very dense situation, which used to be our uh, forest, reserved forest, and so the entire reserved forest area around this part had to be cut to make space for uh, for the refugees. So here you can see the refugee camp on one side, which used to be a forest, and here on the other side is the actual forest, which is right outside um, um, the campground. So, and, and the house that you see here in the middle is actually our house, which we built for ourselves um, with bamboo and a, and a structural system that we have developed 
uh, to be able to build these structures um, in many ways in the refugee camp, in many other displaced situations. So we are working with a lot of displacement uh, now, and, and many of the displacements are internal displacements. So these are Bangladeshi, Bangladeshis who do not have land and home. So we are basically working with them to provide home um, with, a, with a very basic structural system of bamboo, and in the camps, uh, in the refugee camp, the only material one can build with is bamboo because of its temporary nature, because nothing permanent is allowed inside the camp. So, uh, so when we built in the camps, we had to use bamboo as a material. So, um, so this is one of those one of the, the the house that we have built for ourselves right outside the camp, so that we can go and work with the refugees because it's a co-creation process where we are actually working with the communities uh, to generate design program and also to build. So that's our office and our uh, stay um, when we go uh, on site to work. And you can see here the entire building is built out of bamboo and we have these steel connectors that actually allows us to, to create that space. But mm, the idea is that even if you bamboo is your material, there is still the sense of space and the quality of light that I think is absolute uh, of importance. And this is a project in the refugee camp. It's a women-led community center where we have built the entire structure We're using the same structural system as I was mentioning, where we have the steel joints and connectors and using bamboo as a material um, and thatch as roof. And the facades are also bamboo, but at the same time, you can see the that you know, uh, even if it's a humanitarian work, uh, the quality of architecture, the quality of space needs to be always you know, uh, in the forefront uh, because everybody has a right to good quality architecture, good quality light, good quality space. Um, and so that's it. I will try to finish it with a small project that I started with. This is, a, this is actually a, um, a collaboration between me and Rana Begum. Rana Begum is an artist uh, uh, who is a Bangladeshi origin, but a UK artist. And uh, we were invited to work together on a project called Is This Tomorrow? So this poster that you see, um, This Is Tomorrow, is, a, uh, is from the last century uh, in, the, in the 50s. Uh, there was this energy in the world where everybody knew what they wanted so that was this is tomorrow and so basically there was a, a lot of interesting projects that came out of an exhibition again a collaboration and then after these all these years we are again questioning is this the tomorrow we wanted so um together we i mean the, the, this was all collaboration so there were several artists and architect collaboration and ours was that we want we thought that hope is uh, we should not lose hope that there is always hope and uh, tomorrow should be about hope and and we should not uh, lose that anyway. So so that's why we bring in light again as a sense of hope. And uh, Rana works with colors. Uh, as you can see, you'll see that in my architecture, there's a bit of a color challenge and I haven't really talked about color as much. I like the color of the materials that it in its honesty. So that's what I try to use. Otherwise, Rana is a beautiful, um, you know, she has really amazing works that's absolutely based on color. So she and I, we collaborated. So I, I will finish this with a video and, and thank you so much. The idea was that when you approach it, it's absolutely blank. You don't know what's behind it. So it's just a blank facade and, and you have your way to go into that space. You don't know what to expect then there is this element of surprise of this oculus which is sort of lit with color nothing is completely shut in so it's a space people can walk through and pause and take a moment and think since both of us are quite passionate about light we wanted to create something which brings in that light of hope it was important for us to create a space that was positive, that allowed people to kind of come together, you know, feel that hope. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. <laughs>
Marina, that was amazing. And what you showed at the end there too, with the um, with the color project there and just showing how impactful it can be to incorporate even just that little bit of color with very specific or intentional interventions like that is, is so fun to see and hopefully inspiring for the residents. Um, I want to leave it open for some questions, but really quick, I do just kind of want to say that, um, you know, I really liked what you did say earlier on in the presentation when you said when we design, we design feelings. And because the residents are working on designing a house for a poet, that can just raise so many um, issues, solutions, and thoughts and concepts on that end and, and to that effect. And thinking about how this theoretical poet might want to live their life in these spaces and how you can incorporate such strong feelings with the light that you've um, that you've used in your projects. And I want to know kind of, is there any sort of testing that you do to see these conditions? And while the residents are making models to test the lighting and color conditions of their mm -hmm. projects, do you have any advice for them in terms of testing or model making with these um, mm -hmm. with these projects because you've achieved such amazing results with the right. lighting? Right. Well, you know, with light, it's, I think, most important part is that your observation, your, you know, when you go somewhere, when you see any place, I think you need to develop a certain kind of sensitivity and sensibility about light that's, that needs to go on. I mean, it probably for me, it has happened over 20 years. Um, but, I, you know, as an as a initial way, the way I, I started working, especially when I designed the mosque, uh, we we built this large scale, like half scale models. I don't know if, if half scale makes any sense to you, but you know, one feet is equal to half. I mean, half uh, inches equals to one foot. Uh, that's how uh, we used to design. Basically, making a a poor part of the model, and then and then putting the camera in and trying to take the light. Um, and then to see what kind of effect that light actually creates. So basically taking a light bulb and moving it through the model uh, from the sides and then and taking photographs with, uh, with a camera. I think that really helped a lot. So you get some sense of understanding, like how the light might reflect from the wall, you know, whether it washes the wall or, you know, so I think those are also, you know, ways, but of course, these days you have computers, you know, and at that time when I didn't have the opportunity of these light simulations and things like that. So it was working with model. And I think model really helps in the sense that you get the scale, you also get the sense of, you know, proportion and a lot of things that, you know, how, how much opening or aperture should it be you know, the tactility of the surface and everything, I think uh, with model, it's much more, for me at least, it's much more easier. These days, uh, you know, things have changed. So, <laughs> so you know, I mean, if you ask me, I, I would have worked with models, yeah. Thanks, do we have any, it looked like maybe Yasmin had a question. Yes, hi, Marina, thank you for your lecture. Hi. I followed your work for a couple of years. I, I, I think it's so beautiful and I, I, I was going to ask about the about the last project that you did in, in Dubai, but um, you spoke about it and, and actually you, you, you sort of jokingly said, I, I, there's not a lot of color in my work, but here I was able <laughs> to work with it. But I mean, in all your projects, you, you, you use different materials, um, mm -hmm. and even when it's brick, sometimes I assume it's, it's differently sourced bricks. Uh, and I was yes. curious if you could speak to that maybe uh, the selection of bricks or whether it's it's completely mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah 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 I mean uh, and you know I I I studied at a time in the eight, late eighties in the nineties when uh, in my school in Bangladesh we were still heavily bombarded with the modernist idea and ideologies so honesty of material it kind of got ingrained in our system so um, you know when we use brick. Um, when I try to address a material, let's say, I mean, brick can be of different colors. You know, you could have light, very dark, bright orange or, you know, depending on the earth, depending on the firing. So you can get different kinds of bricks. So basically when we source brick, um, and, and I, I, for me, I mean, that's the color. I mean, that's basically all you need actually. 
in that sense, um, in its honesty. So uh, you can choose the brick based on you know, what kind of an ambience you want to create and, and the tactility of the surface. Do you want it a very finished brick or do you want it to be something of a handmade? Um, and, and so I think the texture, how does it feel when you, when you touch the brick? I mean, everywhere you go in architecture, in anywhere, be it concrete, be it wood, uh, you definitely has to have to touch the building to be able to sense its, uh, you know, to create that connection. So I think that tactility of the material is also very important. So, you know, if you're designing for a poet, definitely the poet uh, will want that, uh, that feeling of, of, you know, touching a surface, be it a wall, be it a table, be it, you know, so, so every element, every material that you suggest has a certain you know sensibility and a poet works with all its all their senses they're creative people like all of us so you know that i think is very important when you when you do a design where every sense has to come alive and so choose your material accordingly Yeah, hi, it's, a, it's a very it's a very interesting project though <laughs> i would have loved to be a, a resident <laughs> <laughs> yeah hi rashika yeah. hi hi i have one question it's it's not related to light but um, uh, it's like i'm practicing uh, in india and most of my projects are in northeast part of india so quite close to your place bangladesh mm -hmm. And working in uh, such a remote areas and um, uh, also in the border areas, I found most of uh, the South Asian cities are forced explicitly uh, to participate in the globalization. So uh, today, uh, like so, due to the globalization, we are in the rapid transition. So um, and also due to the consumption of data based on the modern technologies. Um, I feel uh, identities of individual and also the communities along the South Asian borders or uh, countrysides are getting reshaped or reconstructed in uh, some new ways, you can say. So uh, even not only the identities, but also the social structure and the forms, built forms, which are coming out of it and the aesthetical notions also getting changed. So uh, in such context, um, uh, how do you define aesthetical values and spaces um, as being a contemporary architect from mm -hmm. South Asia? Right. Well, you know, we've been working also in the fringe areas, uh, working with local communities, uh, developing housing, uh, developing different kind of projects. So... Um, you know, definitely, as you mentioned, that values are changing, aesthetic uh, requirements are changing, and it's all influenced by, let's say, the cities also, uh, whatever they see, um, you know, television, films, a lot of things have its own effect. And, um, and in many ways, um, uh, the way to work with that, I mean, the way we found a sort of a balance is that you have to come to a balance or a compromise between uh, the two. And um, and that's why I think the co-creation process really works well, in the sense that you know when uh, when you sit together and and that's the way we kind of work, um, especially when we go to the um, the smaller towns and small villages, is that we sit together and then we we ask them what they want and what their aspirations are. And they make these aspirational models, which are, you know, brightly colored, a lot of ornaments. I mean, that's fine. That's their, that's their aspiration. You cannot, um, you know, you have to respect that. There is no way of not respecting it. I mean, I think as architects, we also have to understand that, you know, uh, you just cannot take your own idea and go to a place and, and just push your idea onto people because quite often these things backfire because the moment you're out, they'll start painting it. They'll make it their own. And I think that's their right in a way. So I feel that, you know, as architects, we should also understand the fact that, you know, there is a certain 
part where you need to let go, let people own it. And that ownership also comes from their own choice of materials in many ways. But at the same time, it's also our duty to tell them that, you know, this is better than that. Maybe you could still stick to this one because this is natural, because this is, you know, this will last longer or, you know, that's a, a poor plastic. You don't need that. Or, you know, it, so there are ways of when you work together and you give up some certain of your ideas then they also try to respect and and so i think there is a kind of a back and forth a negotiation you can say and 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 that probably is the only way to uh, to work when you are on the field but at the same time i think there's a lot to change in the in the countries especially in the in the cities where we are building and designing and so a lot of responsibility comes on us when we are building our buildings in the cities not to create an example which becomes a bad example for the others to follow. A lot of responsibility, yes. Great. Marina, thank you so much uh, for such inspiring uh, presentation. Um, very poetic and I think truly right on to the subject that we are exploring uh, and very much worth uh, revisiting. Uh, I, I just wanted to extend my uh, gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And good luck with the project. <laughs> we would love to have you on the final review too, Marina. If you're interested in joining us, I'd be happy to send you a Zoom link okay. to that yeah, virtual let, review. Let me, let me know the date and I'll see if, if, if you know, the it time. It would be fantastic and, uh, to have matches. you. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, and if there's no other questions from the residents and the audience, then I think this is a great time yeah. to end. Um, and we really, really appreciate you being here again today, Marina. I think this has been amazing and hopefully really helpful for not only the residents, but also anyone in attendance. Um, and we will be happily able to keep in touch and invite you to that final review next Thursday. It's the 27th and it's at 10 a.m. Eastern. And anybody can sign up for that uh, through the link that I just posted in the chat as well, if you're interested in watching that virtually. Um, and then speaking of upcoming events for the residency, we have two more lectures. We have one well, technically a roundtable on Monday. It's the 24th, and we'll be joined by Sanford Quinter, Julia Vandenhout, Michael Maltzen, and Jose Araguez. Um, and then we'll have a lecture by Diana Agrest as our final events in the series. So if you'd like to join those, we just posted that link. But Marina, I hope that we can stay in touch, and we're so thankful that you were able to join us today. My pleasure, absolutely. Thank you for okay. having me. Thanks. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.